In the front here, I have Tracy Dorrington Skinner and Jerry Morrison, who are co-chairs of Voices, and they helped us with their uh, struggle. Uh, the reason this is different than a, a traditional public inquiry is that we are looking for healing. We are not looking for blaming. Uh, we settled with the government. We settled uh, with the uh, colored home. Uh, Voices was found in 2012 when us former residents got together for the first time all across Canada at various ages. The eldest at the time was 86, the youngest 30, and we didn't know each other. Um, there was a lot of uh, stress and anxiety, a lot of guilt and shame people was carrying through the years for decades, uh, privately, silently, and it was a four-day event and we started to find our voices. Uh, we did a lot of singing, praying, crying, laughing, but we realized that we're no longer victims, we're survivors. <clears throat> so the others gave us their approval for voices to continue on their behalf, to advocate, because they said the day for them to get recognition and acknowledgement of the harms that was, they were subjected to, they'll never see that day. And it's very fortunate that uh, a year later they seen that day. And we're very proud of that. But we looked at your traditional public inquiry and it's one where you're, you're being adversarial. It's more of a retired judge, um, listen to all the information, uh, the, the lawyers cut you off from the facts. You're not able to really tell your story. Um, then there's a report written uh, based upon whatever the commissioner feels is important for you, where they really don't have a connection with you as a group or a population or a community. So we want to do things differently. And that, that really um, is, is more of a spin-off to what we did with the settlement, because the settlement was our first part of uh, how are we going to tell our stories and how are we going to do no further harm? Because that's what we, that's what we came from, our, our first uh, retreat in 2012, was do no further harm. So that being said, we looked at the settlement part. There was two claims. One was a common experience, even though you weren't abused, you were subjected to the abuse, you seen what was going on with the neglect. The other part was <clears throat> if there was further harm. And we wanted you to tell your story, so <clears throat> it wasn't a traditional investigation where you're being interrogated and asked questions and you have facts and documentation. It was what harm did you suffer in the home and what kind of impact did it have on your life? And that meant a lot to a lot of people because they never got to tell their story. And in doing so, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in doing so, it gave them an opportunity to speak their own voice and their own truth. I'll get forward. Takes me a little while to get going though, with the boys. <clears throat> so instead of just being interrogated by an investigator, we want to have a facilitator and an evaluator. A facilitator is the person that's going to help you go through the process because automatically it's going to trigger a lot of bad memories when you start talking about or even writing up the forms about the harms that are done to you. And then the evaluator will look at the levels of harm. And again, you can't put a, a dollar sign on it. Um, but in society, that's a, that's a way of symbolizing that, you know, they apologize for the harms they you suffer. So with the restorative inquiry, we want to do the same thing. We want to have no further harm. Um, and we didn't want to be adversarial. So we want to find out exactly what happened, why it happened, and what matters about it, and what we can learn from the past to go ahead in the future. Uh, the Colored Home was put together in 1921 because the government of the day didn't care what happened to black orphans. It was segregation and racism. Uh, it was underfunded. Uh, the redeem rate was only one-third that a white orphan would get. Uh, the staff was paid less than minimum wage. The conditions in the home wasn't great for us former residents. And um, that was just my own experience when I was there. I didn't know the magnitude of, of the abuse. Uh, when I went to public in 1998 to talk about a friend of mine, Anthony Langford. And the next thing you know, we have 330 people that came to be a part of this class action. And uh, there was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. Uh, the government knew what was going on, they did nothing about it. The black community knew what was going on, and there was nothing done about it. Uh, we felt neglected by government as well as the black community because we looked upon differently. And one of the ways that we wanted to do the healing was this restorative inquiry so we can connect and engage with the black community. And, and with government agencies, as well as trying to find the one voice throughout the various black communities to come together as one to address the bigger issue of systemic discrimination and institutional racism that plagues our province. And when we received the apology from the, um, 
the colored home as well as the government. The governor also uh, not only apologized to us former residents, but apologized to the African Nova Scotia community for the systemic discrimination that was plagued in our history. So we're looking to do something that has never been done before. And so if you're looking at uh, your traditional public inquiry, you're not really getting the full picture, you're not getting the full voice, you're not getting the full truth. So with this inquiry that we have now, it's a, a council of parties where we have 10 voting people, uh, two co-chairs, myself being one, and we have subpoena power if we need be. But we also identify certain partners like the RCMP, the Chief of Police, the African United Baptist Association, uh, the Colored Home, um, various government departments, uh, health, justice, education, community services, and other agencies that we find that are significant in making change that has some kind of connection with the colored home. So in order to do that, uh, we have this council together that's uh, made up of government, former residents, uh, that's made up of uh, people within the black community. And we try to look at what is the best way of moving forward. So we have a, an RI team, a restorative inquiry team, that will go to the various communities that have already done that. And they will get the information from the communities. The communities will dictate the information that we get as to what we do in the Council of Parties. The Council of Parties also, I and mean, with the historical part, we also have reflection and action team. And that's made up of other parties that we identify that works in government, uh, the deputy ministers of community services, education, justice, uh, the African, what do you call it? Double Scotia Affairs, yes. And when we get the information, we can then look at the government and look at what policies are in place that can be changed in real time. So that's the big difference about this inquiry, is that we are actually building relationships and we're making change in real time, so you don't have to wait until the inquiry is over to make changes. And in doing so, we're doing something that we had never done before because we never really had a true relationship with government, meaning that of the black community. So uh, the goal is that hopefully when this is all said and done, that we have already built a foundation for us moving forward in the future in a very positive way of having a real relationship with the black community and government and various agencies. Relationship building is one of the most important part of this process. And uh, Jerry and, and uh, Tracy can attest to that, that when we went public and we were advocating on behalf of former residents, there were so many people that came and lent a helping hand that we didn't even know. And they were very supportive, and when we had a lot of adversity with the previous government, they would come up the woodwork. And one of them being Jennifer Llewellyn. Uh, that's how we met Jennifer. She would often talk about, well, what you're doing is restorative. I didn't know anything about restorative. Well, I just know about respect. You respect people that respect you, and you just try to move forward. But she's been a, a very helpful and instrumental in, in getting us to move forward. And also facilitate us with the, the design team uh, to come up with the terms of reference. And again, it's not being told this is what you have to do. It's what is it that you want. And I have two minutes. <laughs> So I guess one of the, the biggest things that, I, that we're learning from here, that the only reason I believe that we had success is building those relationships and, and, and working together collectives and being open-minded for everybody's uniqueness and not everybody fits inside of a box. And the only way that we're going to be able to move forward and address the issues of systemic discrimination, institutes and racism is that we have to have a safe place for people to express themselves the best way that they know, they know how. I know for the year and eight months that we had the design team together, a lot of people say it's the most positive experience they ever had. But they say, I may say something that may offend you, but I don't mean to. I just need to learn. So in order for us to really uh, embrace this opportunity of accepting people's uniqueness, because everybody around this room today are here for a purpose. Restorative justice. You want to do things differently. The old way doesn't work. So it's an honor for us to be, for me to be here, and for our voices to be here. And I'm, I'm really proud and honored to, to be able to speak a little bit about what the Restorative Inquiry is. But if you want to know more, uh, restorativeinquiry.ca will let you know what we're up to because we have a monthly uh, newsletter that comes out as well. Thank you very much.